Okay, simple equations. They have this form, uh, dy dx equals f of x, g of y, so that you can rearrange it. Divide both sides by g of y. Treat this as if it's an algebraic equation, which it isn't, but you can still treat it that way. And then integrate both sides. If you do the integrals, then uh, you get some function y over here, some function of x over here. You have an integration constant on each side, but you can put the integration constant in just one side, because if you get an integration constant on this side, an integration constant on this side, you subtract the integration constant on this side from both sides, and you get an integration constant over here. It's just a difference of the two integration constants, and it's still just a constant. So you really only have one constant. Um, if you can then solve the equation you get for y, then you get a closed form solution. Okay, so what you get here is you get, well, I don't want to write it out in general form because it'll get confused with this form. Uh, we get some function of y equals some function of x Right here, x plus a constant. Not a function of x plus the constant, a function of x plus a constant. And when we do examples, it'll be clear uh, what that means, and it might already be clear to you because we've done actually a couple of examples. Um, okay. Maybe we can actually solve this equation for y, maybe not. So if we can't solve for y, then our solution is called implicit. Maybe it's still possible. To graph an implicit solution, what I really should have said is more generally a family. Of implicit solutions. I do that with the word solution sometime, but then how that's solutions. That's so bad, I've got to rewrite solutions. Um, We just about always uh, do a direction field. And we really probably sort of should because the direction field can show us if the solutions you get when you integrate here have missed something.
Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to say that. In case let's say in case an equilibrium solution. has been lost in the process. Okay, it's possible when we do this to lose an equilibrium solution. Um, and it may be possible to even lose some other types of solutions if we've got the direction field or at least um, that do the phase thing, uh, we can and, and I said a direction field. Or a phase diagram. Um, to, to show us if they're equilibrium solutions, for example, uh, that have been missed by this process. Uh, you see an example in your text shows a, a, an example where uh, in dividing by g of y, well, if g of y has some zeros, you've divided by zero. So you have to exclude certain values of y. And if those values of y are equilibrium solutions or correspond to equilibrium solutions, um, then you've missed something, okay? Uh, not a particularly difficult idea. Um, so pretty well explained in the example in the text and we'll probably run into it. We'll see if we get to do an example of that. Uh, so these are some things to watch out for when you're doing a, a separate, when you're solving by separation of variables. Um, and that's kind of the picture. Okay, well, a lot of times you don't have to worry about these exceptions these they're not really exceptions a lot of times you get implicit solutions okay so um i think we want to start out with a logistic equation okay so let's say you got And a lot of times logistic equations occur in time. So I'm going to use time as the dependent variable. Um, let's say that dy dt equals I'm just gonna make it simple. One minus y. y times one minus y, okay? Because that'll illustrate uh, a couple of equilibrium solutions as well as uh, at least one equilibrium solution and some of the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, and it's somewhat, well, intuitive situation. Okay, I'll explain what this situation might correspond to, but let's just go ahead and solve it. And this is very much like the first example I mentioned in your book, uh, which is closely related to a logistic equation. Okay, so this separates easily. We can get dy over y times one minus y equals dt. And we can integrate this. Now, how do you integrate dy over y times one minus y? Well, you need to use partial fractions. So. Set y, set the reciprocal of y times one minus y equal to a over y plus b over one minus y. Well, that equals um, going to be a times one minus y plus b times y uh, in the numerator. A minus B, not B minus A. 
kind of easy to do the arithmetic of that. You just multiply numerator and denominator here by one minus y, giving you a times one minus y. Here, numerator and denominator by y, giving you the by. So you have an ay, and I've got it wrong. I've got it backwards. It should be b minus a. One of these days, I'll learn not to do stuff in my head anymore. Uh, so that tells you a is one and b minus a is zero. Uh, so that a and b both have to be one. So that now your integral uh, let me just check it. And one over y, one over one minus. Let's make sure this is right, because otherwise solution get a little messed up. So you get one minus y plus y, which is one over. Yeah, that works. Okay, so this gives us the integral of. one over y plus one over the quantity one minus y dy equals dt. Integral one minus y, natural log of the absolute value of y. And then it's gonna be minus natural log of the absolute value of one minus y. And that's easy to do, you can do u substitution over here. Um, and if you run through the details, you get this. And once you've done it a few times, you'll know what to expect. Uh, and you can always then verify whether you did it right or not by taking the derivative of this, which is one minus y, I'm one over y, and the derivative of a natural log of one minus y, which by the chain rule is negative one over one minus y, which is, uh, and since it's a negative of that, you get positive. So it's very straightforward. And that equals t. You know, put my integration constant on this side. As I said before, you get an integration constant over here, which you might call C1, and an integration constant over here, which you might call C2. But you subtract C1 from both sides to get an integration constant that you might call C3. But C3 is still just a constant. Uh, and so we just call it C. We don't even put a subscript on it. Um, OK. Now, when you get this solution, of course. I'm not having enough room to write all this out, but I'll close it somehow. You get the natural log of absolute value of y over one minus y. And that equals t plus c. So you exponentiate both sides and you get absolute value of y over one minus y equals e to the t plus c equals e to the c e to the t and e to the c can be any positive number. Because e to the c is a positive number. e to the c, if it's c is a big negative number, then it's a very tiny positive number. Uh, and if c is big, then e to the c is a very big positive number. Now, yeah, I don't have room, so I'm going to have to spill this over. onto another board, so I'm just trying to decide which board to use. I'll use this one. Okay. Okay, so what we've got is
absolute value of y over one minus y equals a p e to the t. Where a is positive. Can't be zero, because remember a is an e to the c, and there's no power of c that's equal to zero. Every power of c is a positive number. It can be as small as you wish or as large as you wish, depending on what the situation is. But we still have to solve for y. So uh, is this an implicit solution where we can't solve for y? Or is there a way of solving for y? Well, it turns out it's pretty easy to solve this for y. You gotta be careful because you got the absolute value. This tells us that y over one minus y could either be plus or minus a e to the t, where a is greater than zero. Or, could be equal to a e to the t, where a is just any constant that's not equal to zero. Since plus or minus of a, when a is greater than zero, is equivalent to having an a that could be either positive or negative, but still not zero. Because if you use the minus here, of course you have a minus a, well, that would be an a, that would correspond to an a being less than zero. If you have the plus, that would correspond to a being positive. So we could have any value of a now. Now this becomes fairly straightforward to solve for a, But maybe we'll keep reminding ourselves that A can't be zero. After a while, maybe that becomes implicit, but let's go ahead and write it out. Okay, so this is then Y equals A E to the T minus Y A E to the T. Getting tired of writing that, we'll keep writing it. Okay, and now we wanna solve for Y, so we get all the Y's over on the left and we get Y plus a e to the t equals a e to the t, not y times plus y a to the t equals this, which means that y times one plus a e to the t equals a e to the t. And you know, let's go ahead and write this out. So that now we can divide both sides by this and we get y equals a e to the t over one plus a e to the t. Now that's a very common, well, yeah. You run into this whole solution a lot. Um, And the equation we've just solved is an example of a logistic equation, which we'll encounter in a little more detail later. And, and very possibly in the homework, I haven't actually looked at the homework problems you're gonna get. Um, the algebra doing this reminds you of a lot of steps that you might use in algebra that you haven't used for a while. So gives you a little better perspective on the algebra. Not particularly difficult, but maybe, uh, if you haven't seen it in a while, uh, yeah, just again, something you ought to be reminded of. Okay, so we have this. Now, what's this solution look like? How does it relate to the phase diagram? How does it relate to a direction field? Yeah, we can see, okay. We, first of all, uh, Notice that as T approaches infinity, Y approaches what? Well, e to the t is going to get really, really big. It's going to approach infinity, a is constant. 
So the numerator and the denominator are both going to approach infinity because one plus something that approaches infinity approaches infinity. As t gets big, that one doesn't mean a hill of beans. So we can see just intuitively that y approaches one. Now to see that even more clearly, we can divide both numerator and denominator by a e to the t and establish that the numerator of course will be one and the denominator approaches one over a e to the t which approaches zero plus one. Okay, yeah, and standard thing from first year calculus. So I'm not gonna go through the details of this, just to say, you probably ought to make yourself a note and divide both numerator and denominator by a e to the t, and then use the rules for limits that you encountered in the first month of your calculus course and uh, prove to yourself that the limit really is one. And you don't just have to rely on the intuition that as t gets big, both of these get big and the one, doesn't make a hill of beans difference when t gets really big so that numerator and denominator become practically the same and the ratio of numerator to denominator then approaches one. Well, okay, so however you do it, as t approaches infinity, y approaches one. So if we're gonna do the graph of this thing, We know that as t approaches infinity, y approaches one. So we're gonna approach this line as an asymptote. Okay. Uh, also, if t equals zero, y equals a, over one plus a, okay. So depending on the value of a, that's gonna depend on your initial condition. I didn't impose an initial condition. Um, you could say that y is zero. equals a over one plus a. If we know y of zero, we could solve this for a. And if we know y for some other value of t, well, then we can plug that value of t in here set this expression equal to y and solve for a. Okay, so we can always solve the equation. Um, so that, that's really all we need to know. So basically we're gonna know a value of a. So here's our y of zero. Now I'm assuming y is positive. And we want to test that assumption. Well, in the models that we use, we're not going to have negative y. This most often applies to something like a population model and you can't have a negative population. And other examples, uh, usually you don't encounter the negative value of a, but if you do, uh, you can deal with it. Okay. I've also assumed that y of zero is less than y equals one. And it's gonna turn out that y equals one is an equilibrium solution that we don't get from this equation, this formula, okay? This is an asymptote and it is an equilibrium solution. If y starts out at one, it never changes. Um, and you also have an equilibrium solution at zero if you start out at zero y never changes um, because court, well, we'll see that in a minute. Okay, now it's possible that y of zero is negative. It's possible y of zero is, I, I mean, it's possible that y of zero is between zero and one, between 
what's going to turn out to be two equilibrium solutions. And it's also possible that it's greater than one, in which case, well, we don't have any equilibrium solutions up here. And we've got to, turns out we've got to approach this equilibrium solution. So we're going to have a curve that does this or a curve that does this. So if we start here, then we start from this equilibrium solution, we go through here and we approach this equilibrium solution. And that'll be familiar to you because that's exactly kind of pictures that you were dealing with in the homework that you did correctly. Uh, if y of zero is up here, I should have either put y equals one a little lower or made this a little longer, but okay. If you got a y of zero here, which is possible, then it's going to be this and it's going to go off to infinity in this direction. Okay. So again, that looks pretty familiar. Generally, we don't worry about negative y's. If we have negative y's, either we prove that we don't have them uh, or we deal with them. Okay. No equilibrium solutions down here, though. Um, now, how do we see that these are equilibrium solutions? Well, remember, if the y dt was y times one minus y. If y equals one, then dy dt equals zero at the start. And it never changes because derivative is zero and it, you never have an increase or a decrease. Okay, now there's dy dt is always zero. So y stays constant. Since it's one, that's the constant. And there are no other equilibrium solutions because the only way the side can be constant is for y to equal one or zero. Uh, if you want to do your phase diagram, let's just graph wobbly board here, y versus t. Okay y times one minus y is zero if y equals zero or one. If y is between zero and one, both of these are positive so that your curve is going to be positive on this interval. Now this is just pre-calculus, but you know, you want to be sure you think through this process. Uh, if y is less than zero, then one minus y, one minus a negative is positive. And y is negative, so you're going to have negatives over here. And if y is greater than one, one minus y is negative, and y is positive, so it's negative over here. As y gets really, really big, you essentially have just negative y squared here. Because if i is really big, that one doesn't make a lot of difference. So that the solution goes to negative infinity. And over here, it goes to positive infinity. So that your graph of y versus t is just this, which looks a lot like an inverted parabola. And that's exactly what it is. 
because of course, if you multiply this out, you get negative y squared plus y. That's just a quadratic with a vertex halfway between the zeros, which you can prove by doing a first derivative test, but you can also just prove it uh, from pre-calculus. Uh, so anyhow, using any graphing technique you want, that's what this thing looks like. Well, what does this mean? What are the implications for the graph? Well, the implications are your phase diagram. So this is why. When y is between zero and one, then the dy dt is positive. Meaning your phase diagram looks like this. Out here it's negative, and down here it's negative. Um, and you can't have a positive and negative in the same phase. Okay, again, yeah, y is positive between here and here. So that dy dt is going to be positive between here and here. So we're going to move in this direction. Okay, well, that makes this a stable equilibrium. Of course, it makes this an unstable equilibrium, we're moving away. Well, that's exactly what the picture shows. Okay, and the unstable equilibrium means that if we start near y equals zero, we're gonna move away from it. And then as we approach y equals one, which is a stable equilibrium, we approach it as an asymptote. If y is greater than one, then we're gonna be approaching this stable equilibrium like so. And it goes off to infinity this way. Now, the infinity in this direction doesn't really matter because in application, uh, your domain is just going to start here. So that the actual solution curve, if you start your, uh, if the domain of definition of your differential equation specifies that y is greater, or that, um, yeah, that t is greater than zero. Um, of course, we have t axis here. Then this part would not be part of your actual solution. This would be it. Or this would be it, if I can see the curve on my hand. Okay. So these would be your real solutions. The paradigm model for this is uh, a population model where you have, uh, I, I like to use uh, uh, an aquarium tank where you got a bunch of small fish or that can accommodate a bunch of small fish, but a limited bunch of small fish because there's only so much space. And space aside, the more crowded the fish get, the more they eat each other uh, or eat the young. It makes the young uh, difficult to, uh, it makes it unlikely that an egg is going to mature and, and grow into a fish of any size. And also there are food resources that might not be available. So if you start with a low population, this thing's going to grow exponentially. Okay, so this is a near exponential.
we have nearly exponential growth for a little while, actually for a little or while, maybe between here and here. We have an inflection point here, and then we have a nearly exponential approach to equilibrium up here. And in between, we're transitioning from a nearly exponential increase to nearly exponential approach to equilibrium. We also have an exponential approach to equilibrium here. If you look at the solution out here, you have an exponential divergence from the unstable equilibrium. Well, there are a lot of lessons in this one example. Many times you're gonna get a separable equation that doesn't involve the um, finer points here, okay? That where you don't really have to worry about the equilibrium, everything is, there, there, there are no, no uh, stable equilibrium for the function. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I forgot to mention it, uh, I mentioned the direction field, okay? It's always a good idea check out the direction field. Of course, when you're solving you know, 20 reasonably challenging problems, uh, you don't have time to draw out, meticulously draw out direction fields, but you can always do a few isoclines. Um, so let's just look at the direction field. This is an autonomous equation. So if y times one minus y equals a constant, then what you have is We have this. Now I change the signs on both sides and then rearrange it. And I got this equation, the quadratic equation. Um, and you know, I'm kind of getting down toward the watermark here. I think the watermark might come up this high. Uh, so, I'm going to write it out here anyway. Um, the solution, if you use a quadratic formula, y is going to be one half plus or minus the square root of one minus four c. And these are going to be isoclines. If C is negative, then it's going to work out real well. Um, but if C is negative, that means you're outside of the two stable solutions. Maybe you're above it, or maybe you're below zero, in which case it's not particularly relevant. If C is positive, then it can't be bigger than one fourth because that would make your discriminant negative. Um, and you would have no solution. Um, if your discriminant is positive, if C is negative or less than, at least less than one fourth, less than or equal to one fourth, then you have isoclines where y could be one half. So here's, let's say here's y equals one. Let's say here is y equals one half. And then you get to add a square root of a number 
Um, this is constant. So the isoclines are just going to be straight lines, horizontal lines. Okay. On the isocline, where y equals one, then y times one minus y is zero. On the isocline where y equals zero, and you can find a value of c that makes this quantity zero. You have this between here and here. Well, y is going to depend on the value of c. And you're going to find that for a small c, or for a c near one quarter, you're going to get this. For a c Kind of need to write it out, but anyhow, your, your action field that you can verify is going to look like this. Then you're going to be steeper here and here. You have a symmetry here. You can work out from that function. And even steeper here. And this is going to be consistent with solution curves that do what we said they do up here. If you go above here, you get negative values. Uh, your values of C become, as values of C become large negative numbers, this becomes a larger and larger positive number. And the minus on this thing not makes these negative, and you can kind of work that out. Don't want to get into too much detail on it. Turns out your direction field is going to look like this. And your curves are going to again do what the phase diagram implied. And it's going to match the graphs of this function. Okay. Well, that's a lot of analysis of the logistic equation. Um, again, the interpretation is why is your population? When you have a low population in that aquarium, there's plenty of room for these fish to grow. They're going to reproduce like crazy. Uh, they're not going to find that the young are going to have plenty of room to escape. And you're going to have an exponential growth in the population. Um, as y approaches one, then this rate of change approaches zero again, um, or this, this quantity approaches zero, the rate of change approaches zero. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> population levels off. Okay. Well, there's a lot to do, a lot to interpret there. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples. And let me pause. Oh crap, I didn't record that. Maybe I didn't record the whole blame thing. Um, I think you got the